Just a second. I'll let you know. You're on. All right. Uh, going to start our meeting, so to speak. Uh, a few administrative notes before we get to our speaker. Actually, fun events and are coming. Uh, next week, we have a Dr. Guo who's going to talk about direct primary care, which is a different model. It sort of gets the insurance company a little bit out of the way. So that should be a, a lot of fun next week. Um, early voting. Anybody in here needs a reminder. Starts 19 April. Um, and we are working very hard with the Barbara Howe campaign. Um, by Monday, we think, Ken and I will have much thicker paper stock to go with this and a door hanger. And so we'll have a list of about 1,600 people in Wake County we're targeting. So if you are a candidate, especially if you are a candidate who happens to live in the same in Congressional District 4, we'll be able to give you a spreadsheet, a little map for your phone, and you'll be able to hit all the houses. Like we'll make sure Brian Lewis has a list of 20 or 30 addresses. So over a two-week or three-week period, if you could at least get to 20 or 30. Um, we found out today, and then I'll get off this subject, the primary that Barbara Howe last had in 2004, Ken, yes. there were only 1,154 libertarians statewide that voted in that primary. So this this is literally one where we just need to get two or 300 people in Wake County mobilized and we should be fine. Um, 5 May is out Raleigh, so if you want to work uh, the booth, con talk to uh, Patrick and we'll get you hooked up with that. Uh, 12 May, reminder, we have a candidate training event at NC State. And that'll include about four hours of classes. So, anyway, that'll and that's all. That'll include lunch, by the way. So, with that, um, our speaker tonight is I asked Eric Lamb to come by. Uh, one of the reasons is we sometimes get very caught up in like national issues and what's happening in North Carolina General Assembly, and we forget in our local communities things that often pull together Republicans, Democrats, unaffiliated, what have you, are transportation issues. Um, I was joking earlier, but the Glenwood CAC, which normally probably has 20 or 30 people attend on a regular basis, had 200 the other day because somebody had led them to believe that when they redid the 44070 interchange, that they were going to make Ridge Road a cut through into the mall. Um, if you're familiar with Ridge Road in Raleigh, that's a very nice neighborhood, um, and they were not having that. So just based on a rumor alone, uh, that battalion of residents attacked that CAC. But even up north where I'm at, I mean, widening falls of news. I mean, these these issues, these road widenings, the growth in the city, a lot of these projects are North Carolina DOT projects are not even city projects, but they really get residents energized. They get them very engaged. So if you're talking about politics, growth, policy, and you're not familiar with things like the divergent diamond that's going to go in on 440 as well, um, you're not really an informed candidate and you're not an informed person as far as being part of your community because these programs and these projects really have an impact on communities and people get really emotional regardless of where they sit on the political spectrum so with all that um, our guest speaker tonight is Eric Lamb from the city of Raleigh and we appreciate him coming because he's not been well the last couple of days but he's perfectly fine now <laughs> Can you hear me? Is that good? Yeah, All right, very good. Well, thank you very much, David. I appreciate you having me out tonight. So, um, I'm going to give you kind of an overview of some of the things that are going on with the city of Raleigh right now, specifically. Um, um, so, this is a map that's available online that you can see all of the different projects that are underway in the Raleigh area. Um, that are either being constructed by the city of Raleigh or by the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Uh, I always tell people roads get built in one of three ways, by the city, by the state, uh, or by uh, developers. Um, we don't have any of the, the private development activity, but if you go to this interactive map online, uh, you can take a look and see uh, information about each project and understanding what the time frames are. Uh, it's a really interesting time now in our area. Uh, DOT has become a little more aggressive in terms of uh, trying to improve project delivery and move some projects forward. Uh, and with the economy uh, picking up the way that it has, the revenues have gone up, they've got additional funding, so they're working on spending down those balances and getting the projects moving forward. So they've worked on trying to improve the regulatory environment to reduce the amount of time it takes to, to do project development. Uh, they're doing more projects in what's known as a design build format, uh, which, is, which means there's less lead time on the front end. They're not doing what we traditionally have done with design bid build. 
Um, but for example, the Beltline Widening Project in uh, Southwest Raleigh from Wayne um, uh, Avenue down to uh, Cary uh, is a design build project. He is, he is getting ready to go live with that project with uh, going out for bids by the end of this year. Uh, that'll likely be a three to four year project. So, um, and the project that Dave was just talking about with the work in Country Valley, DOT has indicated that they're going to move forward on that very quickly uh, and, and be able to put that out as a, a design build package next year. So, it's, it's really a, 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 a unusual time in terms of that much uh, work coming down the pipe at once. Um, we spend a lot of time in our office doing that coordination with NCDOT. Uh, we try to make sure that the, the projects that DOT is looking at uh, match up with uh, the city's goals and needs. The city of Raleigh has a comprehensive plan that lays out how, how the city is going to grow, what the, the master plan is for the city. And according to that, uh, we have prescriptions for each street in Raleigh, how wide each street needs to be based on that amount of growth. We're able to look ahead in the future and model that based on how many houses are going to be built, how much development, how many offices, how much retail. We have enough information from traffic data that we can project out in the future and figure out how wide the roads need to be based on that level of development. And so we work with DOT to make sure that everything that's, that's a component of their projects meets the needs of the city. Um, we spend a lot of time coordinating that. You can see a lot, of the, a lot of the lines, all the red lines are all DOT projects. And so we spend a lot of time uh, working with them, partnering with them, uh, we also, um, for example, uh, you see all the construction going on right now along uh, Capitol Boulevard. Uh, that was um, initially, the city went through a comprehensive planning process where we looked at um, the Capitol Boulevard corridor from downtown out to the Beltline. And we worked with the community and came up with a vision for what we wanted that corridor to look like. And um, in the middle of that process, DOT came forward and said, hey, these two bridges at Peace Peace Street and Wade Avenue both need to be replaced, and so um, that gave us the opportunity to incorporate uh, elements of what was brought in from the planning of the, the corridor plan into DOT's bridge replacement projects, and that's been a very successful partnership. And what you see going in now, uh, with the interchange being reconfigured at um, at Peace Street specifically, is a major recommendation from that plan uh, that we're really excited about. In those cases, though, when we ask for certain things to be put into projects with DOT, uh, we have to pay for some of those elements, and so that's part of the partnership that we engage in. There's so many things that are going on. Uh, one of the things I want to give you an overview, though, switch gears. Um, my office is responsible for uh, doing transportation planning for the city. So we do um, traditional street planning, we do bicycles, we do uh, sidewalks, uh, we do transit. We do a little bit of rail. Uh, my office was involved with some of the development of the Union Station development that you see going on now. Um, we're really excited that uh, that project is about to wrap up. Uh, the Union Station, our grand opening ceremony was going to be at the end of the month. And then the first trains will start rolling into Union Station in late May, early June, it sounds like at this point. So we're very excited about that. Um, but that's one small piece of what our entire weight transit plan was, uh, was looking at. And, and the city admittedly has been pretty weak in terms of providing transit infrastructure uh, and transit services. And we, we've operated um, under um, a very lo-fi mentality as it comes to dealing with this transit. In, in an area that's growing and densifying, you've got to really um, provide a, a more substantial, more robust transit system to meet some of those needs. There's a lot of different types of transit technology uh, that, that's on the table. And um, there were a lot of conversations years ago about looking at light rail options for Raleigh. Uh, ultimately, with what's moving forward now, that's not in, in our plan in Wake County any longer. Uh, that is what's being talked about in uh, Durham and Orange County, but we're not here. Uh, but we've got local buses, we've got bus rapid transit, which are a, a type of conventional bus that sometimes is a larger bus, uh, but also operates sometimes in a, a dedicated bus lane. Uh, we talked about light rail. There's and then the, the, the other component of rail is heavy rail, traditional rail, um, um, as commuter rail. Um, but that's the that is a, uh, a train set that can operate on traditional railroad technology. As opposed to light rail, which is a lighter weight vehicle, lighter weight uh, uh, train gauge, and then uh, express buses. <coughs> oh. 
So when we talk about planning for transit, one of the things that uh, we take into account is um, there's a couple of different ways of thinking about how to present a transit system. Um, you can make it about ridership or make it about coverage. And this was a key debate as we went through developing the Wake Transit Plan over the last several years, was talking to the community, talking to our leaders, and explaining the difference between what does a ridership system look like, a system that is designed about providing the highest potential ridership versus a high coverage system. Uh, and that's, that's giving a little bit of that transit to everybody, but not necessarily providing concentrated um, functions of, of um, high ridership. And then there's different types of investment. So you can invest a lot in your capital, which is building facilities, uh, building dedicated busways, building um, infrastructure, or you think that we're taking some of the same monies and put that towards higher operating costs. So we went out to the public and had these conversations. And so this this is a good graphic that illustrates the difference in spending the same amount of money on a ridership scenario versus a coverage scenario. There's nothing wrong with either one of these. It's simply a matter of what your community's priorities and aesthetics are. So this is the same network that shows the same amount of buses in each picture, but a ridership model is just with all those buses on just a few streets and run those buses at a higher frequency so that the system is, is more reliable, um, the bus is um, um, more predictable. Um, sometimes you have to think of the buses come so frequently you don't need a schedule anymore. You said the buses are going to come with a higher interval. And this shows you the coverage model is. Where somebody put it in spreading the peanut butter out for everybody. Um, it's just the same amount of buses were spread across the network. So in that situation, the bus might come once every hour. You know? But it reaches more of the people. Yeah, there's no right answer here. It's a matter of what's right for your community. And then here's a good example of the, the, the capital versus the operating. So you can you go with a less, a less infrastructure, running more traditional buses, or you go with more infrastructure and more dedicated transit facilities. So we asked the public, as we went out to our public meeting, where do you think we need to be on this grid? And so, um, interestingly, we had an advisory committee that had about 80 people uh, that were appointed from uh, all different walks of life and different uh, jurisdictions across Lake County. And we asked them to give us their feedback. Let's see, should do it. So, what's interesting is that right now, the city of Raleigh's bus system, which is, uh, has been rebranded, we're now the Go Raleigh uh, bus system. Um, this is where we're at today. Our system today is about 80% coverage. And only about 20% of our routes, uh, and there's a major routes, for example, along Capitol Boulevard, Newbert Avenue, and uh, South Saunders Street. Uh, those are our only real ridership-based um, services that are operating uh, at about 15-minute uh, frequencies. But the rest of our system is considered a coverage basis. And the goal that was, given, that was given to us by the community and mirrored by our advisory committee was we want to move more towards a 60% ridership model covered. So this doesn't happen overnight, um, and it doesn't happen without making significant thought investment. And so uh, what has been developed is a 10-year transit plan is going to look at uh, increasing substantially our, our transit uh, system, uh, including the financial vehicles in place to be able to top of that. So there's four big elements that came out of that plan. So the, the entire package is about a, a $2.3 billion package over a 10-year period. Um, the uh, $900 million commuter rail component, the commuter rail being, like I said, the, the heavy, heavy train uh, type system, will have uh, $350 million available for bus rapid transit systems. We're going to look at making um, four times as much of Raleigh's bus system into a frequent network. And then there's still a coverage component. Because this is a Wake County transit plan and because everybody opted into this from the countywide uh, sales tax referendum, uh, we wanted to make sure that there was a deliverable for every part of the community and we wanted to link all of the communities together. And so there's going to be a substantial increase in that bus service that links together all of the communities in Wake County. So this, is, this illustrates sort of the backbone of what the, the master triangle system is going to look like when it all fits together. So here's Union Station in Raleigh. This runs up in Johnson County. And what's the purple line here is the commuter rail that would run from 
downtown Raleigh, it's starting in Carter actually. Downtown Raleigh, NC State, Cary, out to Morrisville, RTP, and then also out to Durham and, and any area around Duke. With eventual plans to extend it further to the, the west to go towards uh, Hillsboro and then down towards the east towards Clayton. Now there will also be bus service that parallels parts of this. And then you can see here, this is the Fair Lawrence Light Rail that's being contemplated. And then there's an additional uh, commuter rail option that would go north from downtown Raleigh and go out to Wake Forest and Youngsville and run up the um, CSX corridor up in that area. But, but the, the base plan we're working off of is a 10 year deliverable. And we wanted to make sure that the Wake Transit plan was not a, a big open ended um, planning effort. We wanted to say that one of the discrete, 10 year period in which we could guarantee delivery of the items that was part of the plan. So that's the key part of the, of the, the spine, if you will, the triangle of the 37 miles of commuter rail that would go in into the existing North Carolina Railroad port. And then here you can see the overview map of what the, the entire system looks like for Wake County with some of the uh, express routes uh, that would connect. One of the, the big generators that's out in this area is the Wake Tech campus uh, that's down uh, halfway between Jack and Raleigh and uh, Deep Land. So uh, there's a lot of demand for service down in this area. But again, also you see a network that's going to link up all the different parts of uh, Wake County and hub out of, out of Raleigh. And then this is when I talk about the increase in the frequent network, this is this is what we're going towards. Uh, is everything you see in red lines are basically going to be 15 minute headway services. 15 minutes all day, seven days a week. And then the framework here with the thick red lines, these will be the bus rapid transit corridors. And in these areas, we will not only have high frequency bus services, but they'll also have dedicated busways. So, for example, in Wilmington Street, um, the option that we're looking at there, for example, is Wilmington Street, as you leave downtown Raleigh and go down past the, where the cargo plant used to be, it was just torn down about a couple weeks ago. Um, it's a four lane divided road. And it's actually fairly over capacity. I'm sorry, it's under capacity. Um, it's overbuilt as a railway section. So, one of the things that we're doing there is potentially uh, dedicating a lane of traffic in each direction, be used exclusively for buses, and then we'll have a lane of traffic in each direction to be reserved for cars. So that's a fairly um, low capital version. Along Newbert Avenue, of course, which is that between Raleigh Boulevard and West Med, we're going to look at rebuilding part of the median and doing a dedicated busway down the median of the road. Now, these systems, in addition to having dedicated um, space in the road for buses, they also have a higher um, infrastructure allotment for the stations. So the stations are spaced further apart. It's not just like we have with a, a traditional bus system where you put a sign by the side of the road and that's what you get. Uh, these will actually be station designs. So it's, it's bus rapid transit is, is basically one step down from light rail from an investment standpoint. But you're going to have platforms that will be raised up to meet the level of the bus boarding. Um, there'll be large, comfortable seating areas. There'll be opportunities for prepay as you get on. So it's actually a fairly robust uh, investment. So here you can see just the breakdown on all the elements that are going to go into the Wake Transit Plan. Again, this is a this is a 10-year fiscal constraint plan, um, and that's what we're in the early stages of, of working on right now. The um, self-tax referendum was approved in 2016, and so we're moving forward with uh, all the preliminary engineering and planning studies that go along with that. And so. Right now, we've already started putting into play some of the changes in the bus systems. In fact, some of you may have seen uh, in, the, in the news recently where we started doing uh, more uh, Saturday and Sunday service on our buses. The next part of that is some of the buses will now start to operate longer into the evenings. Uh, one of the frequent criticisms we've had about our bus system is that uh, there's a number of service industry folks that rely upon our bus system, but it doesn't align very well with the service industry hours for, for late night work. Uh, so the bus system that we're developing in the long term uh, will, I believe, be a, a, I want to say, 19 or 20 hour system is what's built into our financial forecast. So again, it's a lot more useful um, for everybody. 
Um, the bus traffic transit is what we're in the planning phases for right now. Uh, we anticipate that the, the first um, elements of the bus system can be done within the first four to six years. Uh, so, uh, after that, after the referendum. Commuter rail, we're looking at the far end. That's a, that's a much more intensive um, uh, development process and also a lot of work that takes place with the railroads to be able to develop that. So I'm going to switch gears and switch modes completely and talk about uh, what we're going to be working on with our streets uh, and our street related programs in the city. So uh, we had a transportation bond referendum that was in 2017. So, um, and it included uh, two primary components. One was um, allocations for projects across the city um, that are street improvement projects by nature. Uh, many of these are, are capacity related to deal with uh, different um, traffic demand issues or safety issues that we have around the city. So about two thirds of that transportation bond um, was allocated for major street improvement projects. Three quarters of that transportation bond uh, is being allocated for major street improvements. Then the other quarter of that bond um, is being dedicated to programs. And I'll go back and that a little bit. The total package was a uh, little over two hundred uh, million dollars. And um, I can go through these. I've got I've got slides for each one of these. This is a just to give you an overview for each one of our street projects that we do. We look at trying to. Um, that can improve all of our streets with what's known as a complete streets mentality. And the idea is that um, we want streets to be safe for all users, uh, whether you're eight or 80, we want to be able to make it safe that you can walk along the street, that you can cross the street safely. Um, so we put a lot of that philosophy into our design of streets now. Um, and this is just a, a good example. This is uh, some of the reasons that bring us along. Um, St. Port Road, uh, one lane each direction, each of our street plans include curb and gutter. Uh, we now have sidewalks that are set back that allow for planting of street trees, make it a, a nicer, more pleasant experience. Um, we're including bicycle facilities, whether it's in the street or behind the curb as part of uh, every project. Um, we include street lights as part of each project, and then also some of the landscape. In the case of Sandy Forks, we actually did some uh, um, fire retention. Uh, and experimental stormwater uh, runoff devices as part of that. Uh, and recently got cited for some uh, national award uh, for the quality of that project. Um, I think in the, in the interest of time, I'm probably not going to get through all of the individual. We, there are a lot of street projects that we have planned. Um, we have we have Atlantic Avenue from Pine Woods to New Hope. I'm just going to run through these real quickly. Uh, looking at uh, Trailick and, and Marsh Street, Creek between Capitol Boulevard and New Hope. Uh, this is just proposed to widen the three lanes. Colwood Forest from uh, Lynchburg and Atlantic up to Capitol Boulevard, that would be uh, four lanes to the median. Uh, and, and as far as that, we've added in the piece of Dixie Forest. So it'll be a complete project here on the Dixie Forest. This will be three lanes through here, uh, and then the rest of that will be two lanes. Uh, Six Road, uh, Davis, 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 I've never talked about this before, uh, and this is because of the four door plan uh, from just north of North Hills at Berlin and taking it to Six Lanes all the way up to Wood Road. Um, this is an interesting project because it's, it's um, we're doing a two phase implementation on this project that. Um, it came about as a corridor planning process that was done a few years ago. So we looked at the one person corridor from downtown, um, the, the south side of downtown through the South Park neighborhood, and then all the way up through Mordecai, and then all the way up to um, Capitol Boulevard. And we developed a strategy for this. The first phase of that should be going into, into implementation here in the next few weeks. Um, the first phase is that we're going to work on describing portions of blood and person to make the lanage consistent. Um, if you drive through downtown of one person right now, it's two lanes, it's three lanes, it's two lanes, it's kind of crazy. Uh, our goal is to make it a uniform two-lane section. We'll be looking at adding bike lanes in as part of that. So 
Uh, it should make it a lot more. It should make the traffic flow actually a lot better. I know it sounds counterintuitive to say we're going to take a lot of the traffic away in some cases. That's going to improve traffic flow. Um, but the fact is that those lanes are so narrow, especially down near um, the Raleigh bus station, that the lanes are ineffective as they are. So what you see is people oftentimes um, where there's three lanes to that area, you can see everybody bunched into the center lane and nobody using the outside lanes because it's too narrow. And so with the changes that we're talking about, I should open it up a little bit and make it more comfortable. But make it a little more uniform as far as the flow. Um, and then on um, Lake Forest Road, north of um, the person Street Business District, right now that's a four lane undivided road. We're actually going to convert that to a three lane section. So three lanes, uh, one lane each direction with a center median, uh, center, sorry, center turn lane. And then we'll add bike lanes in as part of that. Uh, we're systematically working across the city to eliminate four-lane undivided roads. Uh, oftentimes there are safety issues sometimes associated with um, people trying to make left turns and they overlap. Uh, a three-lane road will actually carry the same amount of traffic as a four-lane road that does not have a center turn lane. Um, it has a, a, a safer operating uh, pattern with it, so we're doing that. Part of what came out of the transportation bond was phase two of the corridor plan, which will work on converting these sections of the streets here um, to two-way operation. The one-way streets right now, um, it, it, was, it was seen as a strategy to be more appropriate when we now have areas that used to be um, two-way streets. And as part of that, one of the roundabouts at, at Delway and a roundabout at Versailles um, uh, and all the or as I call it, because all things are referenced by food, the circus roundabout. <laughs> Uh, we'll be looking at doing some improvements along Pool Road um, um, from Maybrook out to Barwell. This is right real close to the end of the city's jurisdiction. The future 540 extension is, is just out there. Um, this, uh, this is Barwell Road. We're looking at the, the southern half of Barwell along with the Alignment down here of uh, Pearl Road. Um, this is the, the new Barwell Road um, Community Center and um, Park Elementary School. Uh, this will be a three lane section. The nice thing is, this will have sidewalks and all the neighborhoods in here. We'll a lot of requests from the neighborhoods that want to be their kids to walk to school. So, uh, this will be a nice amenity out there. Uh, this is Rock Quarry Road. Um, we actually did part B ahead of part A. If you've been down to the Long Street, um, what's it now called? Coastal Carolina Credit Union Amphitheater. Um, Walnut Creek? Walnut Creek. Exactly. We all know what it is. Um, we did that line in section first uh, several years ago, and now we're doing this more with this intervening piece, portion between um, uh, it's Creech and Sunbrook. We're actually now working with NCDOT. They're in the process of widening this portion of I-40. Um, and as part of that, they're going to have to re um, uh, replace that bridge at Rock Quarry, and so we've been working with them as a special partnership to look at simply giving them our um, our uh, money that we had set aside for doing the project and combining it with their project. We feel like that's less destructive to the community. Um, uh, so it's it's going to be a, a win win, I think, to pull that off. Uh, trial Road, this is the last section of Trial Road uh, to be widened out to the ultimate flooring section. Everything from Lake Wheeler back in the Cary. If you haven't driven through here recently, this is now the finish from the realignment um, uh, beyond the golf course and through the Renaissance Park area. So, this is just the last section that will eliminate that bottom line. Um, this was one that came apart, came about from uh, community feedback uh, in um, Southwest Raleigh. There was a really strong desire to look at some improvements out here. It's not much in terms of the capacity project, but really it's about going in on a two lane roadway and doing a lot of curb and gutter and sidewalk work in here. Uh, and a lot of folks that um, these interactions, a lot of uh, low income folks, because a lot of pedestrians in this area. So um, we're really excited about this one. It's going to add a lot of, a lot of uh, pedestrian accessibility and safety improvements. Close to QA? Yes. And then we're working with downtown. If you haven't done this, is where Union Station is uh, before Gloria is open. We've been working on developing plans for the extension of West Street um, under the railroad track. So uh, a portion of that was built as part of the Union Station development. 
that we needed to get under this leg. Uh, this is known as the boiling line. And so to access this, this is still an active train line. And those need to be, um, because the nature of the operation is going to be um, bridged over and under. So they actually built this down to where it can come underneath and, and come into the station. You go to the next slide. So, so here you can see this is the tunnel that goes down and sort of standing on where the uh, platform is today. And then West Street comes out right into this area. But what we're actually going to do is, is build West Street station underneath and tie in back over here by where the, um, um, the old train station is today. So we, but part of the bond didn't fund this project completely, but it sets aside enough money for us to move forward with the final engineering design and create some seed money for us to be able to pursue some federal funding to be able to go after a project this large. Uh, this is up in Northwest, uh, this is Leesville Road. Uh, Leesville High School, the high school and the school campus is right here, so we're going to widen the road from O'Neill up to Westgate. And then this is Blue Ridge Road. So as I mentioned before, DOT working on doing uh, a lot of work in the Crabtree Valley. Um, so we have an interchange. You can say about really wide Blue Ridge Road with three lane sections from Burley uh, back into Crabtree Valley. On the program side, there's a few things we have allocations for. Um, we're setting aside money for streetscape projects. Streetscapes are where we typically have existing sidewalks and sort of highly developed areas. But we use streetscapes to get through and do renovations to make them uh, uh, a lot nicer, uh, a lot more usable spaces, uh, a lot more attractive for people to, to, to walk around and experience. Um, uh, one of the big ones we have in the pipeline right now is we're getting ready to do streetscape along uh, Overland Road in the Cameron Village area. Uh, that'll end up burying some of the utilities and make the sidewalks nice and uniform. Uh, what they'd like to do is be able to add street trees along the side of the streets. Um, we spent a lot of time doing corridor plans and area plans. Part of the money set aside from the bond will allow us to do some implementation items associated with those uh, area small area plans. Um, we're spending more on sidewalks right now for dedicated funding for sidewalks than we have in the last 20 years combined. Um, and that's part of the city's commitment to making Raleigh a uh, more walkable community. And, um, uh, there's a significant allocation for sidewalks that are along major streets uh, and in neighborhood areas. So you can go around the city and you can kind of tell about when it was built based on how much and what kind of sidewalks it's got. Um, there's a lot of areas of Raleigh that, that require retrofit if we're going to make them accessible, and that can be tough in certain areas. Uh, on the neighborhood scale, we always ask for that to be by a petition process or down we're going to areas where, where residents want petitions and stop the city shoving sidewalks down the, the residents' roads. Um, on the major roads, all of these are city initiated. We go through and prioritize these. Uh, this is a sidewalk that was just recently completed along Capitol Boulevard, uh, just north of uh, Mini City. Um, yeah, over $15 million being allocated for sidewalks as part of the sidewalk. Uh, and then in certain areas, we're still going through and doing um, traffic calming as part of uh, areas that are neighborhoods experiencing speed problems, speed problems in their community. Uh, and so we're looking to go through and do things like speed pumps and other um, elements that uh, try and um, get people to slow down. Uh, it's not a volume of abatement program, but it is a, a speed abatement program in areas that have a demonstrated speeding problem. And then I talked about the transit program. Uh, there are already some cases of the transit um, uh, development, transit development where the city will contribute uh, elements of uh, uh, cost sharing to certain things that the city would like to see built on top of what the weight transit system would provide for us. So say, for example, um, my favorite example is if you're familiar with Western Boulevard, there's some neighborhoods north and south of Western Boulevard that may not have immediate sidewalk access. So if we're building this bus rapid transit system along um, Western, it doesn't do us a lot of good if people can't get to it. So we're partnering with the agencies that are constructing some of these bus rapid transit systems and add in some city funds to be able to do these elements on the sides to improve connectivity. And then I talked about DOT. Our participation with, um, with NCDOT 
Uh, we've got some fun set aside as part of the transportation bond uh, to do some of those major uh, project participation components. And then we're also interested in public private partnerships. So this is the Pullman Road extension, which is under construction now. It will be a main linkage between Western Boulevard and Centennial Campus of NC State. Uh, this is a public private partnership between the city, the Catholic Diocese, and NC State University, and it should be open by the end of this year. So, hey, I'm actually, this is a good stopping point. I'm going to, I'm going to stop on this right now. Um, and I'm going to open it up to yes. questions. You just stopped on the $200,000 logo. Fantastic. <laughs> I love it. I for it. It's exactly what I look for. Um, I have a couple questions, but I won't hog the mic. So go with Amy first. And uh, if you need eating, please don't get French fries. So hold my microphone. Don't worry. I haven't eaten French fries. So you're, you're safe. <laughs> Thank you, Eric, for coming and talking. Us and providing us with a you know a clear representation of exactly where our tax money goes because a lot of times it's not always obvious. So thank you so much. Uh, so my question actually goes back to one of your earlier slides where you talked about transit technologies. I feel like a lot of those were old technologies. Is there any part of the plan that's kind of looking forward towards like you know driverless vehicles or um, you know partnering with uh, companies such as Lyft and Uber who are making a real impact on the way we get around. So the question relates to new transit technology. Now you mentioned Lyft and Uber. So Lyft and Uber, we don't necessarily consider those to be transit in the traditional sense uh, because there's still cars on the road. So there's still cars um, that are using the streets. Um, so there's been a lot of opportunities to look at transit partnerships with um, companies like Uber and Lyft. One of the challenges, and we talked about this, we saw that in the map with the frequent network and how a lot of those areas didn't have any transit service. There's a lot of conversations about what's known as the first and last mile. So how do you get people from the main transit system into where it is that they're actually going if you're not going to run transit on a coverage-based network? So that's where the, the technology's the technology's too nascent at this point. There's a lot of interesting things, especially on the front of um, autonomous small transit vehicles. Um, there was a pilot that was done up in D.C. last year, and it was interesting because it was a company that did um, 3D printed transit vehicles, and they were, I think, eight or eight or ten seats, and um, Ollie, that was the name of the company, O-L-L-I. And it was an autonomous vehicle that worked off of uh, IBM's Watson AI platform. And all it did was run around inside National Harbor and run people around. And so that's where the conversation is evolving to say, we would have trans along these major corridors and the options to look at having an Ollie type system that could, could feed into neighborhoods. Um, or for example, we're gonna end up in a system where uh, in downtown Raleigh specifically, we're gonna have two major transit hubs. It'll be a kind of a binary system. It's, you're gonna have Go Raleigh Station, which is where we just finished our renovations. That's gonna be a, a, a major, remain to be a major bus hub. And then you've got Union Station, and we're looking at phase two of Union Station that'll be a major bus component. The question is, well, what happens when you've got people that need to get from one to the other? Now it's only, from a walkability standpoint, it's about six or seven blocks. Um, we've talked about the notion of, of some type of shuttle service that runs back and forth. I have to think about it from a bus driver standpoint, it's probably pretty monotonous. Um, but that's exactly the type of thing that some type of AI uh, autonomous vehicle based system could really handle for us. So the, the fundamental answer to your question is a lot of that is out there and it's coming. The It's still nascent technology, it's still being developed. And as we saw in our first fatality with Uber's uh, autonomous uh, on-demand service uh, a few weeks ago, it's still in development. But I think that that's what everybody's looking forward to. Um, I think with what we're talking about in a traditional bus system uh, framework, that autonomous uh, vehicles in, in the transit industry are, uh, are very promising um, because a significant portion of the actual operating cost of the bus system is your labor force. And so moving that into um, a uh, uh, autonomous vehicle format, I can see a time where we move away from having bus drivers and instead have more like a, a concierge on the bus. The bus is driving itself. 
Thank you. So, so I have quite a bit of familiarity in transit. I sat in South Florida Metropolitan Planning Organization's uh, CIR. Regional involvement groups. Questions that come up to me is, uh, you know, Bright Line brings private investment in and is offering rail service through existing corridors. Uh, Bright Line is actually a subsidiary of FNC. Um, South Florida is running high speed rail. It's one of the first functional high speed rails running trains at about 130 to 150 miles an hour in West Palm. And uh, yeah, okay. completely private. Uh, they get around the uh, agreements on the rail because it's a subsidiary of the owner of the rail. Uh, we have a, a good rail infrastructure in place. Looking at that, we're literally taking the billion dollar line item and letting that go to private investment where the resources may already be in hand. And it doesn't become a billion dollar taxpayer funded. We hope people will ride in the train, but rather that private investment goes in and they will have done the studies and they're willing to enter into the agreement a certain level of confidence that they'll get their money back versus our money going into the system. Um, I think Amy actually touched on it very well in, in the question. We, we talk about these technologies. And you, you mentioned there, there have been two fatalities involving vehicles that had autonomous features in play. One of which is the guy who was in a vehicle not supposed to be unattended and ran into the side of the truck. Yeah, the, and the other Tesla. was a pedestrian who stepped out between vehicles and would have been hit by anything moving. And that's only one fatality out of almost 200 million miles so far. So the notion of calling it basic technology, it, it, it is up and coming. And, and the big concern we have is we, we spend a lot of money looking at five and 10 year pictures. Going in 10 years, this is what we hope to see. In the meantime, there's going to be empty buses and people are just going to get a button on their phone and it shows up for them. Whether it has a driver or mm -hmm. and, the, and the Uber and Lyft drivers are paying their fuel taxes and consumption taxes just like the rest of us are. So, so they are putting into the system. Um, my, my big question for you is going to be regarding looking at the private partnerships with companies like Hyperloop, and perhaps the, the public component being you know, securing that right away design and letting the private investment build the infrastructure. I need to give you my So there was a lot in that. Let me see if I can get my first. Um, you brought up Hyperloop. That, you know, it's kind of funny. There's certain things in, in my field I always refer to as beer conversations. And everybody else has got a beer except me. <laughs> I, Hyperloop is a perfect, perfect beer conversation. I think Hyperloop, pardon the pun, is a pipe dream. I, I do not think that um, that that is a realistic or sustainable. I, and, I, and I'm a I'm a child of sci-fi. I love the idea of it, um, and I know that Elon Musk has more money than sense. Um, but the fact is, I don't think that that is a realistic or viable transportation system. Well, the key is it's their money. That's right. That's right. That's the key. Ah, but but now here's the question: In that situation, where does Elon Musk? get the, the right of way to be able to build that type of system uh, under somebody's private property. So, because he's, he's not an agency that has condemnation authority or has the ability, he'd have to go through and, and purchase every single bit of the he, 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 he does have enough money to do that. He does have enough money to do that, but, um, but again, the viability is limited. And again, that's, that's, a, that's, a really, that's a really interesting model, and because someone with that much money going after this, um, I'm real curious to see the demonstrations they're talking about with that now. Um, and frankly, there's an aspect of it that I, that I think there's a almost astronaut level of, of G-force that people will have to withstand to be able to, to handle that level of transportation. Um, but I'm intrigued. But I, I, it's 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 fascinating. That, that's what they told Elon when he said he was going to build an electric uh, luxury car. Mm -hmm. You can go buy one today. Oh yeah, no, no, I, I love that. And that's what they said when he said, I'm going to send a rocket up with private funds. Mm -hmm. 
and he's going to send one up every 13 days. Yeah, for the next 90 days. These aren't mass transit answers. These are individual transit answers. Or small, small. So, but to drill into the fundamental part of your question, the talk about public, public, uh, public private partnerships, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of industry that's moving in that direction. Um, it's not going without controversy. So, for example, um, there was discussion about moving forward with a public private partnership in Charlotte and the I 77 corridor uh, to look at um, doing a uh, public private partnership to build. Um, uh, high occupancy uh, tunnel lanes along there. And there was a lot of public pushback about that um, and concerns uh, about private investment money being used in a public highway corridor. Um, that's, I know it's a more popular model in Europe, um, certainly, but um, still has some, some hiccups to get through here. Um, I think that anybody that wants to operate a private rail system on on uh, our railways have at it. I think mean, that'll be fantastic. Um, I encourage them to check out Black Line. I will, but I'm not I'm not familiar with that. Um, I don't know that there's an interest in this quarter work for that yet. Um, and I, again, I've seen I've seen trains in Europe uh, in, in Virgin. You know, for example, they operate their own train system on their on their corridors. The the thing that's funny about um, the American train network versus the European train network, as it's been explained to me, is that the American system is built around freight and they let passenger rail operate in those corridors. The European system is built around passengers and they let freight operate in those corridors. So it's a, it's a little different mentality from an ownership standpoint. Um, the primary rail corridor we're going to be using here is the North Carolina Railroad Company corridor uh, that spans North Carolina. Um, and it's kind of funky as a, as a entity anyway, because it's a it's a private company, but the state of North Carolina owns all the shares of the company. So is it public? Is it private? It's, it's, it's like Fannie Mae. It depends. It depends on the day, I think. Um, but yeah, no, I think the opportunity to, to have the private company going to do that would be fantastic. Has there been any talk about? Wait for the mic. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Travis has been waiting, and then we'll go to Lonnie. Kind of a two-part question. Um, I see a lot of uh, buses and rail systems being built, but there's a whole lot of people that don't have any interest in riding on buses or riding on trains. I'm one of them. I want to drive in my car. And I used to live in Atlanta for 12 years. It's a disaster down there. And Raleigh being one of the fastest growing cities in the nation, a lot of people that I talk to say, too little, too late. We're way behind on roads. I, I didn't see anything about 540 being finished. I, I believe it needs to start immediately because it will let up a lot of this inner city traffic. If you can get to Deepway and Garner and Holly Springs faster using 540. And my second question is how do you handle imminent domain issues where you're taking over people's property in order to build a road? And uh, 540 would be a big issue where um, I don't believe that um, you should take over anybody's private property to build a road if they say no. And so it's a two-part question. Um, I, I believe we're too little, too late. I don't have any interest in riding a bus or a train. And why isn't 540 being funded and finished quicker than these roads? Because if 540 is finished, these roads will get let up a whole lot quicker on rush hour traffic. And I lived in Atlanta for 12 years. I've seen this, and that Raleigh is getting just as bad, and it will get worse if we don't do something about the, the roads right now. Not 2000, or not 2020 or 2022. I mean, right now, 540 needs to be finished. That's my question. But you don't want us to use eminent domain to be able to get what we need to finish those roads. No, I really don't. Yeah. I work around that. Yeah. And that's that's a that's a, a tough um, that's a tough dichotomy. So there were several things in that. Let me see if I can unpack that. Uh, I really focused on projects that were in Raleigh that the city of Raleigh is, is responsible for. Uh, the 2540 is an initiative that is uh, working to build what's known as the usually called the Raleigh Outer Loop. Um, 
Uh, the, the southern portion runs from uh, Holly Springs to I-40, and then the eastern portion will run from I-40 up to uh, uh, 64 bypass. The southern portion has been accelerated. Uh, NCBOT is working on that now. Um, they're finishing the final environmental impact statement uh, elements for the entire completion of the loop. Uh, but they're going to focus on constructing the southern portion first. Um, I can't remember what the time frame is. It's within the, the next three or four years. Um, and you know, that gets behind that specific section of roadway into the commentary about in a domain. It's an interesting conversation about the value of planning versus um, how, do you, how do you plan for infrastructure? How do you set aside what you need to from a large scale framework from a planning perspective versus not holding people hostage over their property? And that was one that recently came to head with a lawsuit over North Carolina's MAP Act, where the state had the ability to basically lock in somebody's property and prevent them from developing it in a certain way um, for the purposes of preserving that corridor for that future road. Um, but the problem was that it locked up everybody's property and the, and the state wasn't, wasn't confident. They said, we're not going to buy it yet, we're going to buy it in the future, but you can't develop that land, or if you try to develop the land, then we have the right to try to purchase it from you first, prevent development. So that's been a, an interesting interesting dilemma in terms of how you do these large-scale infrastructure planning process, projects in advance of the growth. So if you're protecting what you need for a major highway, which is 300 feet wide, the answer is it requires a lot more advanced planning and permitting to be able to do that type of thing to know exactly where the road's got to go. Because when you talk about eminent domain and, and property acquisition, the road elements that the elements that go into road design and road placement go far beyond individual property lines. And property lines in nature are an arbitrary, arbitrary construct, you know, um, because there's a stream and there's a historic house and it doesn't matter where the property line is when you've got to avoid that stream and avoid that, that historic house, those are resources. So um, I can tell you from the city standpoint, we, we don't like condemnation. We, we do not prefer to do that. We prefer to compensate landowners and we make fair offers on their property for what the, the value of the additional right of way is that we need to be able to widen the road or build the new road. Um, and and uh, so we, we work with property owners on, on, on every basis that we can. And almost all of our cases are, are settled without condemnation. Uh, I'm happy about that. But there are there are the, the ones that do sometimes. Um, so there's, there's a lot that goes into placing street. And sometimes in those cases, we do have to shift things around to avoid that. Um, and that gets into a financial conversation of, of dollar cost on what's more cost effective to, to make that challenge or, or to try and avoid it. But there's so many factors that go into the, the place and design of that that that's, that's, that's a lot of tackling. Bonnie was next. Yeah, yeah my, ex, my question is... Uh, Close to the mic. Close to the mic. My question is, what uh, has anybody considered using monorail? It was a, a pretty good I, uh, idea that was... Uh, used by uh, Las Vegas and fairly successfully. And they're actually very happy with it. They're looking to expand it. Have we, uh, have we looked into that? So yeah, the question was um, if we've evaluated monorail. And uh, I'm a big fan of The Simpsons. And uh, one of the most legendary Simpsons episodes ever is building the monorail. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is that it has not taken hold as a prevalent um, um, alternative. And it's interesting because you know, I've looked at it, um, the, the one that's probably the most prominent now is Seattle. And Seattle built uh, an initial segment of monorail as part of the World's Fair. Yeah, it's from 1963. Yeah. It's basically recently, paid for itself, by the way. They recently went through and did an expansion of that monorail. Did they? Yeah. And so, um, but that's one of the only ones in the U.S. Um, the other technology has been talked about for certain instances. Um, and don't laugh when I say this, is gondola. Um, if you, the, the most prominent version of this been done in the U.S. is in Portland. Mm -hmm. um, and it was specifically a, a section that needed to um, bridge between a lower part of downtown and an upper part that was elevated with medical complex. And um, uh, I think it started off as about a $15 million project and ended up as a $60 million. But, 
that's a that's a technology that is again more prominently used in Europe. Um, does not allow for a lot of stops in between. This, so it's, it's not like you're you're not like a point to point to point transit system. It is one point to the other. Um, but that is something that has been talked about in a, in a couple of instances that that could be a cost effective alternative to a, a higher price and physically impactful fixed skyway system. But I agree. I, I don't really know why monorail has never taken off the way that it, 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 it seems like it could have. So, uh -huh. hi, Jack. Yeah. Hi, Jack. Um, I haven't seen you yet. Uh, I have a team that's uh, worked with you all around the station about a year and a half ago. So, um, really excited to hear about the rest of the extension. Um, but I actually wanted to ask about um, what y'all's long-term plans are as far as downtown transit is going to be if uh, arenas and or stadiums are built in the downtown area. Just out of curiosity, because I know, you know, we talked about a soccer stadium and everybody has these pipe dreams about pulling the PNC arena, which admittedly doesn't have the best connectivity in the world outside of Wade Avenue and small streets. And it is kind of out there, but I, I just don't see downtown Raleigh having the ability to handle it without having to really go above and beyond with something completely different than what our current transit systems are in downtown. So I'll let you go with that. Um, there's, there's two parts to this. One, um, there is no current plan for a stadium in downtown Raleigh. There's there is talk of a of a particular soccer franchise that they have one and one done, and it was kind of a surprise to us when we saw the renderings and said, "Oh wait, you want to put a stadium there?" And uh, I I found out about it on Twitter, so that's how I found out. Yeah, so there was there was no advance coordination on that one whatsoever. It was pretty funny. Um, so no, we have not started the conversation yet on what, but let's say that does become a reality. We haven't started the conversation yet on what it would look like to, to build a functional transit element around that. Now, there's, there's two things, uh, I'll focus on one thing. We're actually in the process of, um, well, we did the Wake Transit plan. We saw the big map that I had with all the red lines and all converging in downtown. When we developed the planning for the, the fiscal constraint plan and putting that out there, we drew a black box around downtown. So downtown is so complex, it's going to require its own work to look at how all these transit routes come to downtown and feed what we needed to feed. So we'll come back and we called that the black box. Well, now we have started on the black box study. It's going to take us about 18 months, and, and our charge is it, it's probably going to be the most multimodal study that we've ever done um, because we're looking at the entire downtown grid. And, and, and Raleigh's downtown grid has evolved over the years. There was a big push in the late 60s, early 70s to convert it to one way streets. We've now done some of those based on what we know now about certain types of planning versus what we need for functionality. Um, the bus system in downtown Raleigh today is a coverage based system so buses come from all over like a spider web and they come to, to go to Raleigh station. What we're talking about is the likelihood of consolidating the buses that are inbound onto key specific corridors and what will happen and right now you know we've got a downtown Raleigh circulator. That's a fare free service. Um, we're probably going to move away from something like that because when we start to consolidate these bus lines on these specific corridors, you're going to have buses coming by every two minutes. You know, so you're going to have some high frequency concentrations. There'll be different buses. There'll be the number four, the number seven, the number twelve. They'll all be going to the same place more than likely. So what we think is that if somebody is crazy enough to put a station in downtown and tear down the Arsdale building and do all those things over there. We would be able to develop a bus system that would, would, would have enough frequency uh, adjacent to that that we could serve. Um, I think the, the, the thing that would be foolhardy hardy for us to try and do is to try and serve something like that and with uh, structural parking, um, given the transit opportunity. Um, 
Miami recently went through this where they talked about the fact that they were doing a, a soccer proposal and they proposed no parking for any part of their facility. And the rationale was we're gonna use we're gonna use existing transit resources and we're gonna let the other the other parking infrastructure we've got absorb it. People if people want to get there, they'll figure a way out to get to it. And it makes sense when you think about it in an urban environment because why would we want to invest all that money in additional parking resources that are only going to be used a fractional time? And the thing that we're thinking about from, from parking in the long term is the fact that when we start to look at traffic vehicle projections for the autonomous vehicle market, we may not need parking because if everybody's moving towards the, the Holy Trinity, which is a if you'll pardon me for using brand names here, uh, Google cars with an Uber framework and a, and a Tesla uh, uh, electric battery, you know, um, everybody's going to be on demand. So why do I need parking in that situation? So it's not completely crazy to think about us approaching a, a soccer stadium with that same type of mentality. Bobby, if Nancy will have one more. Um, but just a side note, eminent domain is an artificial construct also. Um, we have had something imposed on us that none of us agree to. Is there any way to uproot Agenda 21? Footnote, yes I know, you no longer call it Agenda 21. They change the name every so often to keep people confused. But it's the same old thing. You're still converting traffic lanes into bike lanes. You're still putting in roundabouts. There's roundabouts up there. Agenda 21 is still going on. Is there any way for us to wrap it out? Yeah, that I don't know what Agenda 21 is. That's a laugh. You're talking bike lanes, you're talking roundabouts, yeah. you're talking what Agenda 21 was set up to do, and what they have done in lots of towns, they did it in San Diego, they've done it in lots of places, and they're doing it here. Go to Hillsborough Street if you want to see what Agenda 21 says. So I was involved with the development of the original Hillsborough Street plan. There was never anything involving an Agenda 21. But that, that right. is, that they changed the name. It's Agenda 2020 now, or something else. Okay. Um, they, the UN is telling people, through a, a variety of steps, is telling people how they have to reorganize things and have to put in bike lanes everywhere. They're taking our streets that we paid millions of dollars for and converting that street into a bike lane. When they can oh, slow. okay. Um, They're trying to slow uh, traffic calming. That was one of the phrases you used. Yes, sir. Traffic calming is part of it, and that's what they're trying to do is to force us not to use Hillsborough Street, force us to go someplace else. Because you've slowed down traffic on Hillsborough Street. There's only one lane going each way. There, there are bike lanes in the way. There are roundabouts in the way. So you're trying to force us off Hillsborough Street and on Western Boulevard. You know, you're about to do it to us right here. Just on the other side of Crispy Cream there, mm -hmm. you're going to foul up that road. Um, I, I have a difference of opinion on fouling things up. Um, yes, we intentionally limited the amount of traffic that can use Hillsborough Street. Right. Yeah. That's your term for it. My term for it is you fouled it up. You drive down Hillsborough Street and time how long it takes you now and how long it took you 10 years ago, and I think you'll see what I mean. Oh, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, okay. I have no relationship, no familiarity with Agenda 21. There was no national directive that led us to doing that. That was a community-led effort that said, we want to improve pedestrian safety and economic viability of Hillsborough Street. Hillsborough Street's gone through a series of undulations with um, development patterns in that area. Um, it was pretty seedy in the 1970s. It had a little bit of renaissance in the 80s. Um, I went to school there from 89 to 93 as an undergrad. So I saw a lot of Hillsborough Street. It went into decline with a higher vacancy rates, but we also had a high percentage of pedestrian crashes, ostensibly exposure by the number of university students that we had in that area. The goal of the Hillsborough Street initiative 
was to look at how do we make Hillsborough Street safer for pedestrians and how do we improve the economic viability of the street. So we created a scenario in which, yes, we took away lanes of traffic. It was what's known sometimes as a road diet. Um, we reduced it from four lanes down to two lanes each direction. We added in the median. We increased, we doubled the amount of on-street parking that was available in the area. And then we did a lot of sidewalk improvements out there. So the traffic volume back in the early 90s on parts of Hillsborough Street ranged between, I want to say 22 to 30,000 on parts of the street. Just pretty high for that type of street to carry. Um, at the time that we started the um, major work back in 2007, 2008, the, the first phase of phase one, traffic volumes had dropped. And that was part of a national trend where, because of gas prices and the, and the economy and the recession, vehicle miles traveled went down in general. So the traffic volumes dropped. But we knew that we were constraining Hillsborough Street and we knew the traffic would divert either to Western Boulevard or to Wade Avenue. Um, but the two goals that we had for the street, we accomplished. We have dramatically reduced the crashes along Hillsborough Street. We dramatically reduced the amount of pedestrian crashes that we had. And we've incentivized over $500 million in private development in that street for what in the first phase was a $10 million construction project. In the second phase, right now, what's under construction is about an $18 million construction project. So that was not specifically a traffic project. We didn't use roundabouts on that. Um, and roundabouts are something that uh, are becoming more and more commonplace. What's that? There are two. There are two now. Actually, well, there's three that went in this part of the first phase. There's the one on Poland in front of NC State, the one at Hillsborough in Poland, and the one at Groveland behind the Players Retreat uh, on Oberlin. And then now there's three more under construction now. So there'll be a total of six when, when all this next phase of work is done. So I get Phil's question real quick and then JD and then wrap it up. And we should be thankful for it's not Franklin Street because otherwise it's from Carolina. No matter which of the ways you skew your, your uh, planning, uh, whether you get more coverage or more it's going to be yeah, in the other direction. Oh, yeah. What is your, uh, so would you comment upon the idea of simply allowing private companies to run buses where they please so they would find those gaps and make money by filling those gaps? Yeah, I don't, I don't know we have an objection to it. I think the, um, uh, well, I mean, this one we have, we have taxis. So the, the issue is we just, so talking about the, the coverage-based systems, these of those areas are large enough and so not dense. As part of what the, the challenge of making transit work in those areas anyway is the, the lack of density. Um, if you think about Raleigh, for example, there's, there's large swaths of Raleigh that are all just single-family housing, which is a terrible development pattern if you're trying to operate transit successfully. And at the same time, why would you want buses running through a neighborhood like that anyway? Yeah. Let taxis go in there they go in small bus. Yeah. Could go back in some cases. Now it's not a good fit. If nobody would want that service, then it becomes a good decide. Exactly. We're not going to do it. But if there are gaps that they think that they could experiment at private expense, city pays nothing to experiment. The private company either does a good job and develops it or decides it is. Yeah, right now they are not allowed to conduct this. In other words, in Puerto Escondido, Mexico, they have so chimneys all over the place, yeah. running all the time. All right. Why can't it work? Katie's got a question, and uh, again, I want to thank Katie because he drew a lot of maps for me. We both really cool. went to the health department now, so he gets his turn. Okay. Say thank you. Thank you. Mic close to your mouth, please. Mic close to your mouth, please. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, but, yeah, I, uh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, yeah, you kind of briefly mentioned 
some of the trade plans as, as far as going out towards Wake Forest and Moldville I mean, um, I'm just curious if you could stand on it just a little bit because I know everybody's trying to um, from what I know, again, the weight transit plan did include the requirement that we link up all the communities. And then it gave the individual communities the option to be able to opt in with some matches to be able to do if they want to do local circulated service. So, for example, with Wake Forest specifically, um, we, the city of Raleigh, uh, work with Wake uh, Wake Forest, and we're running Wake Forest Express. And that Express operates out of downtown Raleigh, you go to Raleigh Station. It has one stop at Triangle Town Center, where we have a hub there, and then one stop at downtown Wake Forest. And then from there, the town of Wake Forest actually operates a circulator service that connects parts of their community. And from a, the, the frequency versus coverage standpoint, they run a loop. A loop is, is tougher to. Uh, Loops are falling out of favor um, from a transit perspective because of uh, the fact that you're over here and you want to get over here, you have to go. Um, but for roles, well, specifically, I think the, the conversation has been to look at either an extension of the wake service to roles for or a direct service to roles for. Um, but that's evolving, and that's going to be through the next phases of the development of the plan, which ultimately require full feedback. Sure. All right, so I'm going to wrap up with my own question, then we'll wrap up to begin with. Um, so you you mentioned the density and the bus service not working. Basically, mass transit doesn't work unless you have mass. General general agreement. So you have to have the mass. That's a good way to put it. Um, but you have in Raleigh a city council that wants to be sustainable and what they mean is protecting neighborhoods, and so it forces kind of the growth. You focus on building these roads farther and farther out, 440, 540, then expanding 98. Travis's point actually, once you finish 540 Southern, it just makes Clayton all more accessible to RTP. And that's why Johnson County Public Schools grow faster than Wake. So the question is, what do you do? Because it doesn't seem to, I mean, I, you go to more of these, and it doesn't seem like you can fix it in Raleigh. Raleigh's not going to accept the density in a lot of areas that would make mass transit would work and would make the city grow the way it needs to. It's at 460 now. It seems like we're just sprawling out. And regardless of what you're trying to do with mass transit, it's not going to work because. Especially with the current city council that you basically work for, is inhibiting the growth that would make, you know, if a bus stops in a suburb, it doesn't work. It has to stop in front of a big building with lots of people. So, your answer? So, I can't comment on city council policy and positions and such. Um, Raleigh has a comprehensive plan, and that comprehensive plan calls for development along the corridors um, and sort of ends up moving this more towards that, that whole ridership framework that we were talking about that um, um, you want development to take place along those major corridors and, and some intensification of that to be able to provide the, the effective transit service. Because the last thing that we want to do is to go out there and spend public dollars and operate a system that's not getting used, not getting used sufficiently. So if you're going to have, if you're going to have a successful transit system, it does require you to have at least some strong nodes of development. You don't, you don't have to strip out a corridor, but you do have to have strong nodes along that corridor where you're going to have to stop the intensification around those nodes. Um, the, the thing about sprawl that's interesting, um, remember I mentioned before where you have those, those large homogenous land uses. Those are the scenarios that generate um, the most car trips because you have to get in your car to go get anything um, from a from a land use standpoint, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a civil engineer. I'm a, my background is systems engineering, transportation. I'm not a land use law, but what I've seen is demonstrated outcomes where dense, mixed use, walkable environments generate less traffic per square foot than traditional sprawling style of, of development. Patterns. Basically, a city. Basically, a city. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so, number one, I do appreciate you coming out here um, when you weren't feeling quite right. And I'm glad you made it. Um, I also feel bad that you're uh, not able to enjoy the food and beverage that everybody else has. So, uh, if everybody wants to oh, my yeah. thank you. Uh, come back out here next time. Um, I hope you all found it educational or at least uh, somewhat informative.
probably a slightly different Greek than what you're used to dealing with. I don't know. Um, but uh, thank you again. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.